Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on what time you're watching this podcast. This podcast series we call Race, Culture, and the Church. Race, Culture, and the Church. And as I like to remind everyone, uh, the, it's like a Venn diagram uh, where you have a circle that's race, one's culture, one's church. And the ideal is if we were to intersect all of those and we have that conversation and we've been privileged to have uh, uh, different ones step into this space um, since one week, literally one week after the murder of George Floyd. And so on the regular, we've had folks come in, theologians, regular folks, um, and just uh, speak on race, culture, and church. And I am pleased. I am, I am absolutely pleased. It's uh, taken a minute to, to get to this point, but to have in our space, in this physical space in North Oak Park, Phil Oates, chairman of the board for Buzz Oates. Welcome, Good morning, Phil. Pleasure to be here. Oh, it's 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 our pleasure. Let me just read this intro. It was uh, it was pinched off of uh, as I like to joke, but not joke our our um, research team of me uh, <laughs> that actually uh, scraped up uh, information from uh, uh, your website uh, on your on your uh, charitable golf tournament, and I'll just read this. Phil Oates is chairman of the board for Buzz Oates, a leading commercial real estate developer in the greater central uh, Valley of Sacramento. And he should have put the leading, but a leading uh, commercial real estate developer in the greater central Valley of California. The Oates Family Foundation honors and promotes the legacy of his father, Marvin Buzz Oates. Phil Oates is prominently involved in local philanthropic efforts that support faith-based fundraising, children's causes, and education. Phil is also a local owner of the Sacramento Kings and is passionate about his community and the future of the city. He, believe, he believes the best days for Sacramento are right around the corner. We'll get back to that in a second. Um, and here's a quote uh, uh, that I, I, was, I got from a, another interview that you were part of. Phil Oates is a strong believer in God, philanthropy, and the Sacramento Kings and candor. Um, I had the pleasure of hearing you speak at a recent event and definitely wanted to have you in this space. Uh, I just knew uh, when I heard you speak, I said, oh, I love his heart. I love his testimony. I love what he's sharing. And yes, we will hit all three uh, circles on our Venn diagram. So welcome. So if you just tell me just what are some of the things you've been up to recently and maybe some of the things that are uh, around the corner, what is, what is Phil Oates, uh, the person, the, the developer, the philanthropist, the owner of the Kings, what's Phil up to these days? Well, professionally, Buzz Oates, it's, it's a company and it's also my dad's name. So you have to, in this time together, you'll have to discern, is he talking about his dad? Or is he talking about the company? In this case, I'm talking about the company. Uh, God's really blessed us in this world of Amazon and Google and Target and big boxes. I mean, that's what we've always done. So it's been in our sweet spot. We were declared essential during the COVID. And because distri distribution was at an all-time high, because that's how people got everything then. And so uh, God's blessed our company, and we're growing faster than we can sometimes control. Mm. Uh, we've, we've had to turn down deals just because the capital required uh, is being used someplace else more profitable, but we're in a very profitable business. We, uh, my CEO, Larry Alba, and my other partner, my CEO, Kevin Ramis, we're great friends. Our motto is humility and patience. I think we exemplify that. And we accept our responsibility in this uh, in this town, you know, we talked earlier, this is a bigger town that really is small in its makeup. Absolutely. And uh, God's put us in a position of influence. And then with that comes responsibility. And especially under the guidance of my partners, we do a really good job of that. Uh, uh, personally, uh, life never ceases, ceases to change. And I'm going through a season of change. And, uh, I know it's all good. Sometimes change is difficult, mm -hmm. but doesn't mean it's not good. And there's all sorts of instances in the Bible where, um, where Jesus had to change the heart of people. And I think I'm doing fine, but I'm in one of those phases as we talk right now. 
So I'm doing great. I still go to work, but I don't go to work every day. And uh, that's a good problem to have. Not to have to go to to work every day. It's a very good problem to have. And so uh, my daughter works with us and she keeps me informed a lot what's going on. After this interview, I will go into work since I'm downtown, but I'll spend, for example, tomorrow, I'll spend all day out at Granite Bay getting stuff done. So you mentioned faith and patience as the watchwords uh, that uh, your north, your, I guess your north star. Uh, did I ca- catch those words right? Faith and patience. Um, well, humi- for the faith company. Faith and humility. Humility I'm sorry. is humility and patience. Humility and patience. I should write that down. But I think down. humility is a way of stating faith. So, so unpack that humility. And I mean, humility, uh, I wouldn't associate that word with the de- uh, commercial development. Uh Necessarily, I think my dad was was quite a character, a very strong, a very influential man. But he did have a degree of humility with him, and that's uh, you talked about the talk I had at uh, Salvation Army. That was a unique day because normally I come in with like five or six bullet points that keep me on on track. That day I was just speaking from the heart. I had nothing in front of me, and uh, I think one of the keys is the humility of understanding everyone is is a prince or a princess Hmm. because the son of God, the son of our creator, died for each one of us. And I just wish people would grasp that concept. It's easy to feel that way if you're talking about a politician, well, maybe not a politician in this world, but an actor, you know, people of high visibility. It's easy to see that that, oh, God's been really good to them and blah, blah, blah. But the people we pass on the street, the people that we look over are still the sons and daughters of Jesus. He still died for their sins. And doesn't that alone, that basic fact alone, gives them value? I don't think it means you've got to give them all money. I don't think it means you've got to become their BFF. But I think you have to respect the fact that Jesus died on the cross for Everyone. You were uh, taking me down a path I hadn't an intend to, but thank you very much. Um, we are in the midst of a community discussion would be too kind. It is a community food fight. You know, sometimes you can have those food fights. Uh, and we're having one around the very issue, at the heart of the very issue you're talking about when it comes to homelessness. Give me your 30,000-foot view or your elevator pitch on the state of where the county is with respect to homelessness. I'm a coach. I'm a basketball coach by nature. You have a game plan going into a game and what you're going to try to accomplish, and you pivot during that game as, you know, as fouls happen or maybe some of your other team is better than you thought. Uh, I don't sense and... I might upset some people here, but I'm going to say it. I don't sense we have a common pathway and we seem to go on this pathway and then veer off and pivot without giving that pathway a chance to prove whether it succeeds or doesn't succeed. I think it will take money, but just throwing money at it has proven it doesn't work. We need something else. There's the mental health issue part of it. There's, and the problem is not all the homeless come from the same background. Some want to be homeless. Some want to be off the grid. Some had just a terrible misfortune happen, and they found themselves on the street. Some are some have PTSD, and they served our country, and we've abandoned them. Are you optimistic? Let me just put it that way. Are you optimistic that we will, not can, will come together and address the issue and its root causes? Not really. I think, okay, that's the end of this interview. I'm just kidding. Because <laughs> uh, I think it's a state issue. It's not a local issue. It's a state issue. And if the state would get, again, have a game plan for how all these various communities will work with each other. I mean, you take this town alone. You've got the county. You've got the city. You've got Elk Grove. You've got Placer. You've got Yolo. Yeah, Rancho. There, you've got all the cities. You've got all these different entities that would— let me ask you, I know you're the interviewer here, but do you think they're working together? No, I, I, that's, that's, that's not anybody's secret. But so that's why my question was not so much, can we, will we 
come together? I, I think we have to get a common game plan that we're all going to buy into that can be fiscally supported. It's not a blank check. And if this and done at the state level, I just think it is a state problem. I read some stat like an unbelievable percentage of the nation's homeless are right here in the state of California. Mm-hmm. We're the hub of homelessness. Correct. And, you know, whether it's Newsom, whoever follows Newsom, you know, whether they have the ability to sit there and create a plan that both sides of the aisle can buy into. Is there a nexus of opportunity between the preeminent developer in this county? You are the chairman of the board of development in this county. You are, if, if, if I were looking up a dictionary definition, your picture would be there. Phil Oates, you're, you're, the, you're the man. Thank you. Um, what's I'm not, I'm not even going to ask if what is that 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 space that could be stepped into to help address that from a development perspective. I think the perfect example to me is St. John's Women's Shelter. That is a building that we were blessed enough to donate to St. John's on on our land. So we became involved with them at the, at the very basic level of support. And with that, they were able to raise their own support. But they take women in there, women and children, and they train them. They have their own restaurant. I don't know if you know that, where mm-hmm. people are trained. And they have like, I want to say it's 80% of the people coming out of that are able to, to merge and facilitate them into the, into the community. Do you know how large the facility is? How many beds or how many, uh, oh. how many folks? <laughs> I should know because that was our office at one time. Um, it's not, I, I, I just, I I'm think just you thinking can look of it up scale. And I apologize. I just met the new director this week. Um, I, it's a lot. It, it's, it's a lot. I'm going to say probably family units. Uh, I'm going to guess it's 15 to 20. That's it's not great. small. No, that's a good size. Particularly that, if you're talking about family units. Right. That's not 15 people. That's 15 families. But you're training them too. You're not just giving them money to support them and letting them do their thing. There's actual training going on. Wraparound dis- services. Yes. So that when these people are at the, when they've graduated from the system, and it's not under a time limit, I don't think. It's under a growth limit. Um, then they can go out and make their own way. Well, I, I, and I think that I think that kind of works. I might suggest that the Sac County Board of Supervisors or um, the mayors of the different cities uh, in the county uh, uh, come scratch on your door and say, um, uh, Chairman, what opportunities uh, exist, particularly given the fact that uh, at least with state government, there's a lot of at home working that there's, you know, occupancy is is lower than what used to be, that maybe there's, maybe there's, again, I didn't even mean to go down this path, but maybe there's opportunities there that could help address the housing aspect, just the housing aspect. Yeah, I don't think you're uh, off on that, yeah. but you take Capitol Mall, the end by the cap, the those buildings by the Capitol, mm-hmm. you can tell what's privately owned and what's owned by the state by, by how well the buildings are being taken Correct. care of. Correct. Um, I don't think you'd want to do that there because that's an economic base that, but uh, that this town needs. Mm-hmm. That's the hub of downtown, really. That Golden One, L Street, K Street area. Um, but I think you're you're on. Let's be creative on where they're housed. Well, I'm all in. If you if if you're looking for a retired engineer that to 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 be an advisor on on that next venture. Just, just let me know. All right. You got it. Let me, about, let me pivot, uh, but maybe not pivot too much. I want to do some uh, some word associations okay. with you. I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, six words um, and no no apparent order, no, no particular order. Development. Development is underappreciated. Unpack that. Because they create the tax base. That provides the social services from police to school to homelessness. They provide the tax base. And I'm prejudiced because I'm on the development side of life. But we are making it so hard. It's like it's like the state doesn't want development. It's something that it almost has a nasty image to a lot of people. Interesting. You you really you've you've sensed that or have you, has it been explicitly 
shared with you. It's like, we don't like developers or development. I'm going to talk in generalities. This guy's been on the radio and talked about it, but I'm going to respect my personal relationship with him. There was an entity that was huge, huge, but it, but it was, but it provided a ser- service that's kind of a dirty service. By that, I mean, it wasn't glamorous. It was just something every town needs. It was, it was refuge. And he would give millions of dollars. He and his family would give millions of dollars to this community. They had a run in getting the permits in another area of our state in Southern California. And it took so long that this person ultimately took his company and moved to another state, a tax friendly state, a development friendly state. And we are not better for having this person leave our community. First, he's a great guy. But second of all, he, he would he would routinely give millions of dollars every year to this town to be used for the needs of this town. And now he's giving it somewhere else. Hmm. Interesting. Community. Community is, uh, I picture like a kumbaya moment where people around a bonfire. Holding hands, holding beating hands. drums. Yeah, you know. <laughs> Maybe smoking a cigar. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, community is doing for others ahead of yourself. Who is community? What is community? Uh, people. People. People in general? People? No, people kind of gravitate to people they like and have and can relate to. So I think there's a bunch of sub community is obviously one big set here in Sacramento, our county. But there's a bunch of subsets in there. Can I be a part of your community? Can you be a part of my community? Can I be a part of Phil Oates' community? Well, I think by doing this, we are. Well, let's but pretend I, we I, didn't. But um, I'm going to be 72 here in a couple of weeks. I'm 65. Yeah, you're, so you're my big brother. We're, we're in the same. We're in the same. Same zip code. And at my stage of life, uh, I'm not just saying this because we're here. I like you. Thank you. So yes, you I like you part too. Of my community. <laughs> now we like each but, other. But what I guess but my, I view, I'm pushing you to to really tease out who who do we invite or who do we consider community? It's because we can look up the dictionary definition, but lived out who's Phil Oates? It's like how I get it. We you know someone said that there's only we're only as humans we're only capable of having 50 intimate relationships, sure. maybe That's 200 casual really I get all of that. But you know in answer to that age old question, am I my brother's keeper? Am I whose community? Who's part of my community? One of the challenges I face is that you know I think we we do what God expects us to do. I don't think we need to be applauded for our philanthropic efforts. I think we're just doing what we should do, but we don't need to be criticized either. Uh, I had one person when they asked me for some money, I said, no, this person got all hot and bothered. I turned around, I said, I didn't know this person. They approached me on the street. And I said, ma'am, you've got no idea what we spend our money on. You don't have the right to criticize me for not giving to your charity, to the, to your need to something you're passionate about, but you don't see that I support other needs, other passions. And uh, so you, that, in, that 50 people, I, I think of it a different way at my stage of life. Do you remember in the arcade, they had those things where you put a quarter in, it would drop to the top level and it would force a few quarters mm-hmm, down to the mm-hmm, next level. Mm-hmm. And it goes through maybe two or three levels and you got the quarters that fell off on the bottom. Mm-hmm. I firmly believe we only have the capacity for so many friends. And by the time you get to be 72, these are long friends. So for someone to be the quarter that I'm going to drop and put on one of the levels, it's going to force somebody at that bottom level. If I'm not, if I'm not part of the, I don't get invited to dinner. Um, I'm sure dinners are nice at the Oats residence, but if I don't get invited to dinner, that's one thing. I suppose where I'm really uh, trying to get us to, to consider is if I see you, you see me, I see some other person as part of my community, then I will move past simple empathy to, to I am concerned about the well-being, welfare of that person. They're Thank part you. of my community. 
And um, I am, uh, you know, someone said a rising tide uh, raises all boats. Uh, but if my boat is leaking, it doesn't matter. Uh, or if, if, if my boat's not seaworthy. Uh, so I guess what I'm saying is if, if we're all, all part of a community, necessarily we see ourselves as interconnected, not on one extreme. I have, you have to, to eat less so I can eat more because I'm hungrier than you are. Or I am just, I'm, I'm concerned about how the table is set, spread, and outfitted so that everybody, the vegetarians, the, the carnivores, everybody gets to eat. Is that community? Well, I think so. I, I think so from, just call it from the wealthier side of that equation, what gets frustrated, you see all the waste, all the government waste. And it's kind of like, okay, get your house cleaned up and then we'll talk. And I think I fall into that sometime when I have people apply to my foundation. I, I have a form they have to fill out every year. You know, what's the head guy making? Is he being audited? Does he have any family working for him and or her? And, uh, but I think there's a responsibility in community. And I think Buzz Oates, I think individually Phil Oates acknowledges that. You just can't help everybody in that community. Understood. Uh, so we, development, community, how about another word, government? Government, wasteful. <laughs> <laughs> Just I got to call it the way it is. That somebody said you are known for your candor. <laughs> well, it's, you know, I, I just, you just look at all the waste. Does it have to be, or is it, inher it's an inherent part it's of so the process? so much part of the process. It's, it's, it'd be even a guy with, and, and I don't know Governor Newsom. So I'm going to give him credit. Let's say he really wanted to cut back waste. It's so entrenched. You know, the two in, the, the, the uh, retirement package has offered people. I'll give you an example. And I've got some, a, a, the police get their retirement package based on their last year of work, I'm told. And, I believe you're correct. And so a lot of those guys take all sorts of overtime that- To bump up that to number. To bump up that number. Now they retire, and then you know what they do? They Take move another out job. of the state. <laughs> so, I mean, maybe I would not make any friends. Nobody's ever going to elect me a politician. But, I mean, <laughs> I, I think if you're taking that money out of the system, it should not be as much as the person that stays in California and reinvest that money back into our current society. Is the government, um, a politician said at one point, uh, government's not the answer, it's the problem. What do you, where, where does government fit in the toolkit of responsibilities and solutions? Oh, I think you need government to, I think it becomes too much a part of our life. We do need government to kind of be a referee and to be, or to be the parent that ultimately makes decisions. And uh, I, I think we've kind of, fate, we've not done that for a while. I think both sides of the aisle are in a, for lack of words, a, a pissing match with each other. Mm -hmm. You didn't cooperate with me, so I'm not going to cooperate with you. And that's, that's been going on for two decades now. Dare I say, uh, what, coming up on 250 years of, uh, of existence as a, as a country, I think that uh, nothing's new there. Um, another word, success. Following God's path. Unpack that. Well, I, I mean, you have to ask Jesus in your heart first. It doesn't make any sense if you haven't. But I mean, everybody wants to measure it by your bank account, by the number of friends you have, by your the number of followers you have on Facebook. There's all sorts of metrics that, that do tell a little bit of the story. But it's fool's gold if you're not trying to follow Jesus and take advantage of the opportunities you face every day. And that's been your, your North Star for your life? Not always. But lately, as I've gotten older, yeah. So you're, 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 I appreciate your candor. Again, someone else said it's like, you're going to get a straight story uh, uh, from Phil um, to just say that mm, I haven't always uh, followed that North Star. Uh, I veered off the course. But uh, uh, as I like to say about myself, um, 
I'm better than I was yesterday, but not as good as I hopefully I'll be tomorrow. So it's, it's that, that progressive, uh, as theologians would say, as scripture would uh, indicate, sanctification process that's going on internally uh, with believers, that there's this progressive betterment spiritually. Um, it's, it's refreshing to hear you say that um, I'm, on, I'm, I'm, I'm getting better. Yeah, I think that the key is you got to surround yourself with like-minded people. Uh, you know, if you hang around people that I don't want to pick out a specific sin. So whoever's listening to this, think of, of a, a common sin or common challenge. Maybe you have, if you surround yourself by people that are not going to help you fight that, they're only going to add to that problem. Mm. Then you're in for a rough go. One of the keys is I've got a few friends, but they all make me a better person. They all make me, you know, think about God a little bit more. Not all the time. We still, we still have our moments. We're enjoying life. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, one guy that comes to mind is, is Taro. Taro's a dear friend of mine, dear friend of mine. Owner of McCooney's Owner restaurant. Owner of McCooney's. We travel the world together. But, I, but he just does a little thing of a daily devotion where it's a commentary of his personal life and a devotion and a scripture added on the end of that. That makes me better every day, Pastor. Some days it speaks to me. Some days it goes over my head. But in the long haul, just thinking about it. And we've got to surround ourselves with people with people that are going to make us better, not worse. I need to be on your email reflector there with Taro. Um Success, new word, family. Family is, uh, well, that's funny. I, I don't know how to answer that, but except it's people that ultimately accept you for who you are and you've shared some of life's most intimate moments with. My dad died in 2013, December, and just last week, on July the 26th, we had the party on the 27th, but on July the 26th, my dad would have been 100 years old. So my family had a couple different parties going on that week. We had a party just for the family on Tuesday night at my sister Judy's house. I had a great time. Even with the struggles I'm facing right now, I had a great time. And so did my sisters, so did my nieces and nephews. So then we were at Thursday's party, and, and I asked the question, I said, do we all agree we had a great time this week? And yeah, it's been great, been terrific meeting each other's kids and stuff like that. And I said, but do we, all, do we also admit we've always not been so, uh, it's not always been so easy, and we've not always been so happy with each other? And they all said yes. And I said, well, what's caused the difference? And my sister Judy says, I think as we've gotten older, we've become softer hmm. and less judgmental. I love that. And I think that that's what has happened. And as you reach that age and you, re, you see your own life's imperfections, you know, you're less critical of others because you see that log in your own eye. And I think in a family, that's, that happens to its ultimate. I love that. I love your definition of family. Uh, folks that uh, you've, shared, you've shared the most intimate aspects of life and they, uh, they take you in. Yeah. They don't kick you to the curb. Yep. That's, that's, it transcends DNA. That is something, by the way, family's not DNA. Yeah. Family's the heart. So. <laughs> <laughs> Last word, faith. Faith. Faith is something, think of a life raft. Sometimes you're in that life raft and it's smooth and life's going good. Sometimes you're hanging off that loft, hanging off in the, the uh, waters, the, the waves of a roaring ocean, and you're barely hanging mm -hmm. on to that. But you still have it. It still has you. You go through different, your faith isn't, for me, hasn't been a consistent measuring tool. There's times that I'm walking right with Jesus. There's time I'm looking down, I'm only seeing one set of footprints. But like the poem says, it's his footprints carrying me. Mm -hmm. There's times I think I got this whole thing wired and know all the answers. I don't need faith. I go through that all the time. 
So I, it's, it's a life raft. It's very good. Very good. Uh, I, I saw this, um, this quote uh, attributed to you. Um, and it was um, when you were bedside uh, with your father as he passed. And this is what the quote says. He took my hand and said at the age of 90, mind you, son, remember, life is short. I know he wasn't being ironic. He simply meant make the most of the time you have. Um, I've asked you about physical, and you've been asked, I've asked you about, you know, physical projects and things that you're most proud of. And as I shared, civil engineer by vocation. So I understand, you know, you can point to certain things and it's like, oh, okay, I had a hand in that hospital or that, this, that, or the other. Um, what are the things that Phil Oates, not chairman of the board of Buzz Oates, but Phil Oates, what are the things that Phil Oates are most proud of that he can uh, identify, maybe not point to physically, but it can identify and say, I'm really proud of that. Okay. If I can backtrack a little bit, that yeah, wasn't in my go. dad's bed. That's when we all knew he was dying. And okay. I would go by and see him every day. Okay. And he grabbed my hand. I can still remember that moment. We were sitting closer than you and I are right now. And he grabbed my hand and said, life, our son, life is short. And I was by his bedside. Okay, my sister Kathy and I were by his bedside when he did pass. But uh, and that came, I want to say that came a couple months later. I hope I'm remembered. I'm going to rephrase your question a little bit. I'm hope I, I hope I'm remembered for having a small impact on some people's lives. One of the things I'm most proudest of is, uh, boy, this was probably... 15, 16 years, well, it's more than that, it's probably 20 years ago. Um, I went and heard Michael Tui speak. Do you know who Michael Tui is? Not. Michael Tui is the father on the movie Blindside. Okay. And I've seen, I'm sure okay. you've seen Blindside. I, I haven't seen it, but I, it's, it, I, might has, I might have well have seen it. Yeah. Let's just put and it that so way. So they, they, for those that don't know, they take this kid out of a ghetto situation and bring him into their suburban home and, educate him and feed him and it impacts his life and this guy ends up being a lineman for the Baltimore Ravens and so I listened to Michael too I was coaching at the time and God just put on my heart how many Michael Ors that's the son that got pulled up and now playing for well I don't know if he's still playing for the Ravens but he was then um how many do we do we pass every day talk to a pastor friend of mine and he took it on himself and wrote the, the outline, the birth of a charity called ACE. And ACE takes kids under the poverty level and, uh, and gets them a private school education. That's what we did. And you don't have to be an athlete. Some of them are athletes. You, maybe you're a great singer or musician or maybe you just have leadership skills. Maybe you're just a difference maker. And uh, if you get into this program, they take great care of you. They, and when it started, we had just maybe 12 kids because it was new and schools weren't sure about it. And, uh, you know, I was tied in a lot to Capital Christian because I was coaching there. So, uh, so that was kind of where we launched this place. It's now in four schools in the California, Nevada. And we've had kids go to MIT that are, that are successful businessmen. We've got kids that have played professional sports. Families were changed, not just the boys or girls that were in this program. Families were changed because I believe the whole problem we have now is not the color of our skin. It's the difference in education. I firmly believe that if I receive the education of, of a, someone that's being underserved and they received my education we would be exactly opposite. We would be who, I, I just think that's, education's a real key, a good education. And, uh, and now that's a charity that's raising over a million dollars a year. Uh -huh. It's grown to 40 people around the state, not another, in Nevada. It's, uh, and it's the name been, of the charity is? 
It's called ACED, A-C-E-D. I should know it's an acronym for uh, it. Drew will have, uh, he will actually post that in uh, on the on the podcast and we'll have a link to it. Uh, oh, that'd be great. Yeah. That'd be great. It's just, so I, it was just a difference maker that we, that we did, we made. And uh, that would be what I'm most proud of. It's not our buildings, you know? Well, Phil, I am proud of our buildings. Well, but I mean, I, and there, but, and you should you be well proud personal. of those. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think you answered that. We're proud well. of Metro Air Park on a business level. That's when you're going out to, to the international airport from downtown Sacramento. That would be all those buildings mm-hmm. on the right on Alva Drive and Metro Drive in Google's back there. And if you look way in the back, those are the buildings that we're building. We're building 2 million square feet out there. We've already built a couple million. So we're heavily invested in that. And that's been a project. We talk about government. That has been a project since the 80s. And there were people that had money invested in that that could not do pay the carry and lost their land. And over a, over a snake, we were putting the value of a snake over the value of people. There's got to be a balance. There, there's, there, 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 there has to be a balance, a, a 360, as I dare I say, a 360-degree view of what it is we do, why we do it, where we do it, uh, all of that. Totally agree. Yeah. Totally agree. Uh, our company, Buzz Oats, you know, we're, there's a, a tree commission or a city tree program that we're participating in. So it's not that we don't believe in ecology, but there's you have to look at what it's costing. What's the what's the results? Correct. What isn't getting done because this is getting done. Correct. And I think sometimes we are on the side of of uh, well, in this case, we put snakes ahead of people. Yeah. Well, I have gotten the high sign, and as again, as I I say on the regular here, I always have more questions than time. Uh, but we'll have to invite you back again. Anytime. Uh, well, Anytime. So you say that. You're a busy man. So this I, is, I, 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 I hope this isn't one and done. I hope that we'll have uh, additional uh, conversations. But I must say thank you again, uh, Phil Oates, for entering into this space and being very vulnerable and open and, again, very candid uh, in your answers Thank you for being here with us. Honored to be here. Really, I'll do it again if you want me back here. It's it's a done deal. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.